On this episode of China Uncensored, the Communist Party is not going to like this interview. Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. I'm here in Australia. The country slash continent is reeling from the revelation that the Chinese Communist Party has been influencing Australian politics. But I sat down with New South Wales Member of Parliament for the Greens Party, David Shoebridge, a politician who's not afraid to talk about Beijing's most sensitive issues. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, are we doing this interview outside because Green members don't believe in indoor offices? Uh, well, we have an office, but I always think it's nice to get out in a park. And um, Sydney, thankfully, is blessed with some beautiful parks. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, well, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about the Greens, like just what you're about? Uh, we're a party that's got four basic pillars behind mm -hmm. it, which is ecological sustainability, social justice, uh, grassroots democracy, and peace and non-violence. How is the Chinese Communist Party infiltrating Australian politics? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest impact of the Chinese government and the concern about the regime in Australian politics is, is this insidious self-censorship that we see from Australian politicians, scared to call out obvious human rights abuses in China, scared to support democracy movements in places like Hong Kong, um, scared to really openly challenge China on some of those you know, appalling um, foreign relations decisions, such as the ongoing occupation of Tibet. And, and it's that self-censorship that I think is so, so deeply frustrating. And, and it's all because they fear a backlash from China, a backlash on trade or a backlash on um, our economic relationship. Australia has one of the, um, the largest and deepest economic relationships with anyone is with China. We have a massive trade relationship with China. Um, but China buys our, our coal and our steel and our iron ore and our agricultural exports and you know, our education services, not because they think we're a bunch of nice guys, not because we're friends and we all sit around and have a cup of tea together, not because they can come over and tickle our bellies mm -hmm. and we'll do what they want. They buy our stuff because it's some of the highest quality and best priced products and services anywhere in the world. And they'll continue to do that, whether or not we call China out for its systemic human rights abuses or not. And I can't understand why what are otherwise intelligent people in positions of power don't get that. And what can Australian politicians do to resist this influence? Well, they could show a bit of courage. They could grow a backbone and they could just stand up for human rights abuses wherever they're happening on the planet. That'd be a good start. I think that's asking for a miracle. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a miracle. I think it should be the basic minimum standard that citizens across the world um, ask of their politicians. For years, you've talked about one of the party's most sensitive issues, uh, organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. Uh, how are you still in office? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, I've definitely had, well, I've had direct attacks mm -hmm. from the Chinese consulate um, mm -hmm. when I raise things in our state parliament. And I find that, um, Remarkable. I mean, I, I haven't had those direct attacks from any other um, government, even though I raise, I may raise sensitive issues about US foreign policy, I may raise sensitive issues about um, Australia's foreign policy and its engagement with other regimes. It was when I raised the concerns about the way China goes about forcibly um, organ harvesting. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only time that I've had that direct pushback. And in fact, a letter came from the consulate to basically every MP in the state parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a specific example of some of that influence? Well, I, was, I have a private member's bill that would prevent Australians or anybody ordinarily resident here from going overseas and engaging in unethical organ harvesting. And of course, I view unethical organ harvesting as a deep moral issue. Just, just for clarity, what do you mean by unethical uh, trade in organs? A any trade that was for a commercial, um, reason, any trade where there was a degree of exploitation um, and of course any trade where there was a lack of consent and you know I'd put top of that list the what we see in China where we we, we know there are organs being provided for their massive transport trans, transplantation system there are organs being provided um, almost certainly from prisoners of conscience um, and almost certainly without consent put into one side the fact that China has admitted that they use the organs of executed prisoners. Um, so if any Australian was to leave Australia and engage in one of those trades in China or Egypt or wherever, um, that would be a very serious crime on the statute books here if they returned. 
they would be found ordinarily prosecuted for an offence equivalent of manslaughter. What was the Communist Party's response to that legislation? Well, the consulate was less than chuffed. Um, yeah. <laughs> it may surprise you. We, um, we had a briefing that we put on in the New South Wales Parliament. Um, and when I was walking in the corridors of, of the Parliament, I had a number of colleagues from different parties saying that they supported it. Um, and, you know, giving me their personal support. Um, so we put a briefing on. We had some human rights experts and some medical experts come in to do a briefing about the bill and why we were presenting the bill. Meanwhile, we had a, a, a huge petition presented. So there was strong public support for it. We had more than a quarter of a million people sign a petition in support of the bill. So there was, there was a political support for it in the populace. Individual MPs from uh -huh. different parties said they support People it. generally don't like the idea of innocent people being killed for their organ. It's not a hard sell. Yeah. I mean, if you explain to people what the problem is, uh -huh. they clearly want us to do something about it. They expect their state, federal MPs to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we put the briefing on, but the morning of the briefing, a letter was sent from the Chinese consulate to each MP in the state parliament, basically saying, um, the briefing is a dangerous attack on China, um, that um, my office um, had worked dangerously with this, uh, had worked with this dangerous grouping called Falun Gong, um, that this was a direct attack on China, and these kind of behaviour in, in, in Australian parliaments prejudiced the ongoing commercial relationship with China. Um, you know, an extraordinary intervention. Yeah. And um, how successful was that letter? It was bloody successful. We, um, we didn't get a single MP from either of the sort of the, the larger parties, the, the, the Labor Party or the they Coalition. They all backed out. They all backed out, even though we'd had a series of RSVPs. So the head of China's organ transplant system, Dr. Huang Jiefu, has said they've stopped using organs from executed prisoners. Uh, I, I plainly don't believe those statements that come um, largely from the sort of central Beijing bureaucracy that say they're no longer using executed prisoners, they're relying only on um, donors. Um, because when you, when you look at the, the numbers in that most recent Mattis and Kilgore study, mm -hmm. the size of the, um, the transplant industry in China is massive. And their, their pool of donated organs, given that there's no history of donation, and there are cultural barriers to it in China, their pool of organs is tiny. Um, and something has to explain the shortfall between the tiny number of organs that would come through their, you know, um, infant um, um, transplant system. Uh, donation system mm -hmm. and the massive scale of their increasingly commercial transplant yeah. industry. And, you know, clearly that, on any view, that's been serviced by, amongst other things, executed prisoners. And for the Chinese to be in denial about it, they can say what they like, um, but the numbers just don't stack up. Yeah, I believe that uh, report you mentioned, Bloody Harvest, puts the number at about 60 to 100,000 organ transplants a year. Yes, with a donation system that's providing, at best, 10% of that. Um, so where's the shortfall coming from? Well, if Wang Jiefu can come out and explain where the shortfall comes from, I will believe him when he says, that it's not coming from executed prisoners. And of course, Wang Jiefu has a history with Australia. And it's one of the reasons why I think we have an obligation to challenge him on this. He's been given an honorary doctorate from our oldest and most prestigious university, the University of Sydney. It's actually where I graduated. Well, I was going to ask, uh, you've done some digging into Dr. Huang's relationship with the University of Sydney. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, Wang Jiefu has been important from the eyes of the um, University of Sydney by establishing links with higher education facilities, particularly in Beijing. Um, and that then produces a large number of overseas students and commercial success for the University of Sydney. And um, I would say primarily for that reason, he was being celebrated and given an honorary doctorate, you know, to, 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 to bolster the commercial interests of the University of Sydney. And, I found it remarkable that when I raised concerns about his deeply unethical history, and he admits to transplanting, you know, hundreds if not thousands of livers from executed prisoners, he admits to that. When I pointed out that that was a gross ethical breach on by any standards, would be unlawful here, um, the, the Sydney University administration and the Senate simply ignored me. Um, and uh, for me, it was a, a clear case of them putting narrow commercial interests ahead of 
what I think should be minimum ethical standards for our universities. And didn't you sue them over, they were asked to release emails oh, about yeah. this relationship? Um, we have um, laws that are, are euphemistically called freedom of information laws in Australia. I think most Western democracies have them. And, mm -hmm. and um, At least on paper. Yeah, at least on paper. Well, we have the laws on paper. I, um, I requested all of the communications that went to the Senate um, and went to the university when they were considering um, granting him the honorary doctorate. And um, what I got back was page after page after page of blanked out documents because they didn't want to show the public what they'd said about him. So they, it was entirely him. redacted. I think we got one email that had gone to all staff and students, um, which we already had, mm -hmm. which largely led to our freedom of information request, but all of the actual key documents, the reasons they gave for giving this guy an honorary doctorate, um, all of that was blanked out. And so you sued them to unredact that? Yeah, we had to take them to court to get them to unredact it. And we ended up getting a significant amount of it um, unredacted. And, and what it showed mainly was what they were refusing to look at. There was no information going to the Senate or the decision makers about this man's history of engaging in illegal and unethical um, organ transplants. No mention of the fact that he'd engaged in hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, liver transplants using the organs of executed prisoners. And with none of that information going before the Senate, you know, they just granted him the, um, the honorary doctorate as like a rubber stamp. To go back to the um, infiltration of Australian society, um, what can your average Australian do in the face of uh, Communist Party infiltration into Australian society? Well, I think the first thing is, it's a question of perspective. Like, I, I don't pretend, and I don't think it's true, that they've, they've got some sort of tentacles that go all through society and they direct how um, our state and, ter and federal governments operate. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that. They are willing to exercise influence when they feel like it's something that's seriously challenging the regime. And they're very sensitive about organ harvesting, they're very sensitive about Falun Gong, and, and, and you know, you'll find almost no other MP actively running those issues mm -hmm. because they get monstered. But the, um, um, I, I think the best thing you can do, if most Australians could do, is just spend more time with people from Chinese heritage, get to know them, um, um, engage in, you know, in, engage in those one-to-one -one citizen exchanges mm -hmm. because, you know, um, the, the people of Chinese heritage and descent who, um, you know, have Australia as their home and we're super lucky to have them, um, they, they cannot become, and what I'd be deeply anxious would be if they were to become, the targets of a kind of, uh, what may become a racist backlash. Notionally targeted at the regime, but the concern is it will end up being targeted at people of Chinese heritage living in Australia, and, and that would be deeply unfair. That actually makes a lot of sense. Are you, are you sure you're a politician? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I take the view that um, there are so few people in politics who actually are willing to say it like it is. They're always trying to hedge their bets, you know? What would regime A think about it? What would this, um, what would this little sectional interest in the community think about it? I, I think people want politicians, I hope, to be trying to actually say the truth, not trying to double speak. The Chinese Communist Party often accuses critics of racism or intolerance to silence them. How can we raise legitimate concerns about the party's actions and not be racist? Well, I think you've just got to be extremely careful to distinguish between the actions of a government mm -hmm. and the actions and the intents of, of, of a nation's people. I mean, in my mind, the, the Chinese people need to be an ally with us mm -hmm. in these. They, they suffer far more from the authoritarian nature of, of their government than we do. I mean, I get a cranky letter. You know, they suffer from a, a regime that is willing to jail them if they speak their mind mm -hmm. or wish to exercise a faith that the, that organisation yeah. doesn't agree with. So, I Or remove their organs. Or remove their organs, kill them and remove their organs. But I, in Australia, which has a very, very um, ugly history of racism, mm -hmm. um, and, and a big part of that racism has been directed against people of Chinese descent, mm. um, people of Asian, um, Asian descent, Asian heritage. I think it's, it is very hard to have that discussion and to work out where to draw the boundaries. And, and, um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. A lot of sensitivities there. Oh, and quite rightly sensitivities. And, and in fact, you know, the former Prime Minister, um, John Howard, as recently as, you know, 20 years ago, was toying with an actively racist immigration policy again. Hmm. Um, 
and that that is very raw and real in mm. Australia and that means when you're engaging in a critique of the Chinese government you have to make it abundantly clear that we're standing in solidarity with the Chinese people both mm. there and here and when you bring up uh, sensitive issues like organ harvesting. Are you ever concerned that this might cost you votes? Um, I, I actually don't think that speaking up for human rights costs you votes. I mean, we're, I'm a party that has a fundamental belief in, you know, core human rights and social justice issues. And, you know, if we're not willing to speak up about this, well, then who would? And, and I actually think um, the great bulk of people, whether it's Australia or the United States or wherever, they actually want politicians to, I think, stand up and challenge power when power is behaving badly. They want them to tell the truth. Basically, they want them to tell the truth simply. Yeah. And I understand you take a lot of uh, your constituents out for hikes in the bush. <laughs> oh yeah, well, we have a um, very successful Greens bushwalking club and um, the, the only problem with it, sometimes it's too popular and we have too many people out on our walks. I, I feel like a bit of a sheepdog, you know, trying to keep <laughs> 40 or 50 people on track for a okay. bushwalk. But we're, we're blessed um, in Australia, um, particularly in Sydney. We're surrounded by national parks, mm -hmm. um, amazing places, you know, um, easily uh, accessible within a day. And, um, you know, for me, that's one of the reasons I'm in politics, to protect and... Um, and celebrate those natural parts of the world. Oh, that's great. Well, maybe next time I'm in Australia, we can do another interview in the bush. Yeah, let's, let's go to the Blue Mountains. We can do the Grand Canyon, one of All my right. favorite walks. Sounds great. Thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure, always good to speak. All right. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who contributes to the show on Patreon. It's a website where people can support the show. Thanks to your support, we've been able to come to Australia and interview people like David Shoebridge. So visit patreon.com slash China Uncensored to learn about how you can support the show.